Hello everyone, this is Mr. A. Today we're going to be reading Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls, Chapter 3. Uh, I've had some questions about where I'm getting these uh, books from. Uh, these are made available to the public through the uh, National Emergency Library. So if you have a book that you've been meaning to pick up, you can definitely go over there and check them out. Okay, let's get started. The dog wanting disease never did leave me altogether. With the new work I was doing, helping Papa, it just kind of burned itself down and left a big sore on my heart. Every day I'd seen a coon track down in our fields or along the riverbanks, the old sore would get all festered up and start hurting again. Just when I had given up all hope of ever owning a good hound, something wonderful happened. The good Lord figured I had heard enough, and it was time to lend a helping hand. It all started one day while I was hoeing corn down in our field close to the river. Across the river, a party of fishermen had been camped for several days. I had heard the old Maxwell car as it sorted and chugged its way out of, its or out of the bottoms. I knew they were leaving. Throwing down my hoe, I ran down to the river and waded across at a place called the Shannon Ford. I hurried to the campground. It was always a pleasure to prowl where the fishermen had camped. I usually could find things, a fishing line or a forgotten fishing pole. On one occasion, I found a beautiful knife stuck in the bark of a sycamore tree, forgotten by a careless fisherman. But on that day, I found the greatest of treasures, a sportsman magazine, discarded by the campers. It was a real treasure for a country boy. Because of that magazine, my entire life was changed. I sat down on an old sycamore log, and I started thumbing through the leaves on the back of the magazine. I came to the for sale section. Dogs for sale. Every kind of dog. I read on and on. They had dogs I'd never heard of, names I couldn't make out. Far down in the right-hand corner, I found an ad that took my breath away. In small letters, it read, Registered Red Bone Coon Hound Pups, $25 each. The advertisement was from a kennel in Kentucky. I read it over and over by the time I had memorized the ad. I was seeing dogs, hearing dogs, and even feeling them. The magazine was forgotten. I was lost in thought. The brain of an 11-year-old boy can dream some fantastic dreams. How wonderful would it be if I could have two of those pups? Every boy in the country had but me. Sorry about that. Every boy in the country but me had a good hound or two. But $50. How could I ever get $50? I knew I couldn't expect much help from Mama and Papa. I remember a passage of the Bible my mother had read to us. God helps those who help themselves. I thought of the words. I mulled them over in my mind. I decided I'd ask God to help me. There... On the banks of the Illinois River, in the cool shade of the tall white sycamores, I asked God to help me get two hound pups. It wasn't much of a prayer, but it did come right from the heart. When I left the, camp front, the campground of the fishermen, it was late. As I walked along, I could feel the hard bulge of the magazine jam deep into the pocket of my overalls. The beautiful silence that follows the setting sun had settled over the river bottoms. The coolness of the rich black soil felt good on my bare feet. It was the time of day when all furry things come to life. A big swamp rabbit hopped out onto the trail, sat on his haunches, stared at me, and then scampered away. A mother gray squirrel ran out on the limb of a bur oak tree. She barked a, whine, a warning to show the four furry balls behind her. They melted from sight in the thick green. A silent gray shadow drifted down from the top of a tall sycamore. There was a squeal and a beating of wings. I heard the tinkle of a bell in the distance ahead. I knew it was Daisy, our milk cow. I'd have to start her on the way home. I took the magazine from my pocket again and I read the ad. Slowly, a plan began to form. 
I'd save the money. I could sell stuff to the fishermen. Crawfish, minnows, and fresh vegetables. In berrying season, I could sell all the berries I could pick at my grandfather's store. I could trap in the winter. The more I planned, the more real it became. There was a way to get those pups. Save my money. I could almost feel the pups in my hand. I planned the little dog house where I would where to put it, collars I could make myself. Then the thought came, what could I name them? I tried name after name, voicing them out loud. None of them seemed to fit. Where, well, there would be plenty of time for names. Right now, there was something more important. Fifty dollars, a fabulous sum, a fortune, far more money than I had ever seen. Somehow, some way, I was determined to have it. I had 23 cents, a dime I had earned running errands for my grandpa, and 13 cents a fisherman had given me for a can of worms. The next morning, I went to the trash pile behind the barn. I was looking for a can, my bank. I picked up several, but they didn't seem to be what I wanted. Then, I saw it, an old Casey baking powder can. It was perfect, long and slender, with a good tight lid. I took it down to the creek and scrubbed it with sand until it was bright and new looking. I dropped the 23 cents in the can. The coins looked so small lying there on the shiny bottom, but to me, it was a good start. With my finger, I tried to measure how full it would be with $50 in it. Next, I went to the barn, and up in the loft, Far back over the hay and up under the eaves, I hit my can. I had a start towards making my dream come true. 23 cents. I had a good bank, saved from the rats, and from the rain and snow. All through that summer, I worked like a beaver in the small creek that warmed its way up to our fields. I caught crawfish with my bare hands. I trapped minnows with an old screen wire trap. I made myself. I baited with cor yellow cornbread from my mother's kitchen. These were sold to the fishermen all along with fresh vegetables and roasting ears. I tore my way through the blackberry patches until my hands and feet were scratched raw and red from the thorns. I tramped the hills seeking out the huckleberry bushes. My grandfather paid me 10 cents a bucket for my berries. Once, Grandpa asked me what I did with all my money. I told him I was saving it to buy some hunting dogs. I asked him if he would order them for me when I had saved enough. He said that he would. I asked him not to say anything to my father. He promised me that he wouldn't. I'm sure Grandpa paid little attention to my plans. That summer, I trapped harder than ever with three little traps I owned. Grandpa sold my hides to the fur buyers who came to his store all through the fur season. Prices were cheap, 15 cents for a large possum hide. 25 cents for a good skunk hide. Little by little, the nickels and dimes added up. The old Casey baking powder can began or grew heavy. I would half its weight in the palm of my hand with the straw I measure from the lip of the can to the money. As the months went by, the straws grew shorter and shorter. The next summer, I followed the same routine. Would you like to buy some crawfish or minnows? Maybe you'd like some fresh vegetables or roasting ears. The fishermen were wonderful, as true sportsmen are. They seemed to sense the urgency in my voice and always bought my wares. However, many was the time when I'd find my vegetables left in the abandoned camp. There was never a set price. Anything they offered was good enough for me. A year passed. I was 12. I was over the halfway mark. I had $27.46. My spirits soared. I worked harder. Another year crawled slowly by. And then the great day came. After a hard, long grind was over, I had it. My $50. I cried as I counted it over and over. As I set the can back in the shadowy eaves of the barn, it seemed to glow with a radiant whiteness that I had never seen before. Perhaps it was all my imagination. I don't know. Lying back in the soft hay, I folded my hands behind my head, closed my eyes, and let my mind wander back over the two long years. 
I thought of the fishermen, the blackberry patches, and the huckleberry hills. I thought of the prayer I had said when I asked God to help me get two hound pups. I knew that he had surely helped, for he had given me the heart, courage, and determination. Early the next morning, with the can jam deep in the pocket of my overalls, I flew to the store. As I trotted along, I whistled and sang. I felt as big as the tallest mountain in the Ozarks. Arriving at my destination, I saw two wagons were tied up at the hitching rack. I knew some farmers had come to the store, so I waited until they left. As I walked in, I saw my grandfather behind the counter. Tugging and pulling, I worked out the can out of my pocket and dumped it out in front of him and looked up. Grandpa was dumbfounded. He tried to say something, but it wouldn't come out. He looked at me and he looked at the pile of coins. Finally, in a voice much louder than he ordinarily used, he asked, Where did you get all this? I told you, Grandpa. I said, I was saving my money so I could buy two hound pups, and I did. You said you would order them for me. I've got the money, and now I want you to order them. Grandpa stared at me over his glasses and then back at the money. How long have you been saving this? He asked. A long time, Grandpa, I said. How, how long? He asked. I told him, two years. His mouth flew open, and in a loud voice he said, two years. I nodded my head. The way my grandfather stared at me made me uneasy. I was on needles and pins. Taking his eyes from me, he glanced back at the money. He saw the faded yellow piece of paper sticking out from the coins. He worked it out, asking as he did, well, What's this? I told him it was the ad, telling where to order my dogs. He read it, turned it over, and glanced at the other side. I saw the astonishment leave his eyes and the old, friendly grandfather look came back. I felt much better. Dropping the paper back on the money, he turned and picked up an old turkey feather duster and started dusting where there was no dust. He kept glancing at me out of the corner of his eye as he slowly walked down to the other end of the store, dusting there and there. He put the duster down and came from behind the counter and walked up to me laying a friendly old work callous hand on my head. He changed the conversation altogether, saying, Son, you need a haircut. I told him I didn't mind. I didn't like my hair short. Flies and mosquitoes bothered me. He glanced down at my bare feet and asked, How come your feet are cut up and scratched like that? I told him it was pretty tough picking blackberries barefoot. He nodded his head. It was too much for my grandfather. He turned and walked away. I saw the glasses come off and an old red handkerchief come out. I heard the good excuse of blowing his nose. He stood several seconds with his back turned to me. When he turned around, I noticed that his eyes were moist. In a quavering said, or in a quavering voice, he said, Well, son, it's your money. You worked for it and you worked hard. You got a, you got it honestly, and you want some dogs? We're going to get you those dogs. Be damned, be damned. That was as near as I ever came to hearing my grandfather curse. If you could call it cursing. He walked over and picked up the ad again, asking, Is this two years old too? I nodded. Well, he said, the well, first thing we have to do is write this outfit. There may not even be a place like this in Kentucky anymore. After all, a lot of things can happen in two years. Seeing that I was worried, he said, Now you go on home. I'll write to these kennels, and I'll let you know if I get an answer. If we can't get the dogs there, we can get them someplace else. And I don't think if I were you, I'd let my pa know anything about this right now. I happen to know that he wants to buy that old red mule from old man Potter. I told him I wouldn't, and I turned to leave the store. As I reached the door, my grandfather said in a loud voice, Say, it's been a long time since you've had any candy, hasn't it? I nodded my head. He asked, How long? 
I told him. A long time. Well, he said, we'll have to do something about that. Walking over behind the counter, he reached out and got a sack. I noticed it wasn't one of the nickel sacks. It was one of the quarter kind. My eyes never let my grandfather's hand. Time after time, he dipped in and out of the candy counter. Peppermint sticks, jawbreakers, whorehound, and gumdrops. The sack bulged and so did my eyes. Handing the sack back to me, he said, Here, first big coon you catch with those dogs, you can pay me back. I told him I would. On my way back home with a jawbreaker in one side of my mouth and a piece of whorehound in the other, I skipped and hopped, making half an effort to try to whistle and sing. And couldn't for the candy. I had the finest grandpa in the world, and I was the happiest boy in the world. I wanted to share my happiness with my sisters, but decided not to say anything about ordering the pups. Arriving home, I dumped the sack of candy out on the bed, and six little hands helped themselves. I was well repaid by the love and adoration I saw in the wide blue eyes of my three little sisters. That's the end of chapter three of Where the Red Fern Grows. Please join me next time as we see what happens with the rest of the story in chapter four. Thank you. I'll see you all then.